Oi oi, it's your boy. The JJ Aldrich Terror, Jack Slack. It's the Jack Slack podcast. We're coming at you on Monday the 30th of August. And it's a bank holiday over here in the UK. But I'm still doing this because I'm the hardest working man in podcasting. Subsection sports, subsection MMA, subsection analysis, subsection British. Fuck you, Phil McKenzie. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, the UFC event, which was pretty good. Some fun fights, even from the Ultimate Fighter alumni. Um, and some decent finishes on that card. And before that, we're going to talk about Jake Paul versus Tyron Woodley, because it was inescapably the biggest event going on this week, which is why I did it for the... Uh, Free excerpt from the boycast. I mean, the boycast, we went 90 minutes on Thursday, so the Jake Paul stuff didn't really end up eating up much of the time. But yeah, I mean, there's no two ways around it. It was the big thing this weekend. I mean, it did more on Twitter and, and by all other modern metrics than the UFC card, but that's just expected. So Jake Paul whooped the ass of Tyron Woodley, uh, and a beautiful ass it is, let's be fair. Uh, everyone, Everyone watching the way in who'd never seen Tyron Woodley weigh in before was like damn he got a booty um but yes uh, this just confirmed I mean confirmed how shot Tyron Woodley is but like Tyron Woodley was always a very low output fighter even in his best days but you know the the chronically low output the the doing nothing against Usman and Covington and Burns and um Luke well, actually, no, not Luke. We'll take that one out. But that was bizarre. And now he's come out and he landed one good punch in the fourth round, I think it was, and looked like he was taking over the fight. And then he went back to not throwing. And it wasn't back to the ropes, not throwing. He was walking forward menacingly and not doing anything. Um, which, yeah, I mean, this is not... We thought the level of competition was probably a factor because, like, he was fighting murderers back to back to back. And he probably, like, were he anyone else, they'd have given him a step down in competition. But, uh, yeah, they, they're not fans of Tyron Woodley at UFC HQ. Uh, and you can see why, because he was a very different... Like, even when he was at his peak and he was the UFC champion, every second fight would be crap. But, yes, it doesn't get much bigger a step down than boxing against Jake Paul. Um, but, yes, he, he was made to look very bad. One judge gave it to Tyron Woodley, which was fucking amazing. Uh, because he was like he won one round, two rounds maybe, but yes, it was it was Jake Paul doing very good things. Well, um, is he like world championship material? No, he's not. He's a gimmick boxer. He's going to make more money doing this, like against people like Woodley. And, and Woodley did have a plenty of advantages on paper. He is uh, the far superior athlete. He's knocked out better fighters. He's fought. You know, he's he's. Um, I was going to say, fought, but he's probably not sparred against better fighters because actually Jake Paul's team are doing a pretty good job of getting him in with good guys. Um, I think, you know, the whole Jake Paul thing is that he's uh, a guy who's been like recreationally boxing since he was quite young. He's in good shape. He's got all the money in the world to pursue this as, as he wants to. Um, the clout will mean that he already sells the biggest pay-per-view of the year or whatever. Um but he also does well on the fact that like people are going to continue to underestimate him despite seeing him do... I mean, like, I, I understand that most people can't assess a fighter very well setting aside their competition. Um, but, I mean, I've been telling you since the, when he fought that, that kid Deji or whoever it was, uh, it, like, he, he is a pretty competent boxer. You can see he understands creating openings, dropping away, landing that big overhand over the top. He did that to Tyron Woodley. Um He's got a decent jab. He smothers people with the clinch when when he's thrown his right hand and worried about them coming back or when they're moving in on him. Um, and, like, Logan Paul doesn't do all those things. Like, all these other YouTube boxers don't do those things. But a lot of people just can't see that stuff. Um, that's not me claiming to have superpowers. That's me that just, you know, if you've watched enough good boxers and you're not super biased against the guy, you can go, yeah, clearly he knows a little bit what he's doing there. But I thought it was very funny because we always have a joke about Dean Thomas, um, you know, very good coach, very accomplished coach and accomplished as a fighter in his own right. But every time Tyron Woodley fought, Dean Thomas would be in his corner going, you need to throw, you let those hands go, Tyron Woodley, uh, throw combinations like, <laughs> you know, just keep telling him to throw combinations like he does it in training or something. But he's never, ever done it in a fight. The closest he's come to a combination is like the stutter step 
left hand running through on a right uh, right overhand. But I don't think Dean Thomas was in his corner on Sunday night because Dean Thomas was doing the Trevor Whitman job in at the UFC card and literally during the Alvi fight, he's going, mm, yeah, Alvi's standing with his back to the fence and you can't really do that. You need to throw combinations. And then it was just so funny because it was li- he was literally describing the Tyron Woodley problem about Sam Alvey. But we'll get into Sam Alvey later because there's some real fun stuff to be said there. Um, but yeah, I liked what Jake Paul did. He let Tyron Woodley come forward and, and um, be the aggressor, as in like visually. But he was outpointing him really well, landing the jab lots. He was taller and longer because he's an actual tr- cruiserweight and Tyron Woodley has always been thick and stocky um, at uh, 170. And this, this fight was contested at like 195, I think it was, or something like that. But... Lanced him up with the jab, used the jab to the body really well, used the right straight to the body really well. And the right straight to the body is something that, you know, I'm always saying is underused. But I remember one of the fights that I was saying, oh, what a great shot the right straight to the body is, was the Wonderboy fights with with Woodley. Because Woodley would put himself on the fence with his le- legs almost level. Um, so he squared his stance up and uh, Wonderboy would get the free right straight or left straight, whichever stance he was in, you know, the rear handed straight, free to the solar plexus every time he wanted to throw it. And Woodley was standing so square following Jake Paul around the ring that the right straight to the body was always there. And uh, yeah, it's interesting because it's quite a, it's quite a, I want to say an amateur punch, but not like amateur, like amateurish. You know, I mean, like it's it's very popular in amateur boxing because um, I don't know if they changed the rules, but for quite a while there was like a punch counter thing where you all had to press the button at the same time. And the right straight to the body is a nice clean one that everyone can see. Because it normally drops underneath the opponent's guard when they're holding their gu- their gloves up, and uh, it, it's a nice long punch, so you you can see it. But even before that, like before the electronic scoring of single punches, it was very popular in sort of like classically trained amateur boxers. Uh, it's just sort of gone out of fashion. Well, it's certainly it, like in the professional ranks, you don't see a lot of it except from southpaws throwing the left straight to the body because it just lines up really well. Um, Body punching, people tend to focus on the left hook to the body, which is a different sort of punch because you have to get closer to do it. Often you don't have to level change. You know, you can do it with just your elbow close to your body. And of course, the liver itself, uh, really basic, I'm a moron anatomy here because I don't have a medical degree or anything close to that. But your liver is the biggest gland in your body or whatever it is, unless you mean you've got a massive bell end. Now, it's the biggest gland in your body and it stretches down the left side of your um torso and i had a doctor show me like percussion where your liver is uh, a little while ago um which which always stuck with me but it is gigantic and it hangs down just under the right side of your rib cage did i say right side i meant to say right side earlier so the left hook goes to it the southpaw left kick goes to it it can catch that underside bit but and that's what people obsess about like a, a liver shot is really quite debilitating it's like if you get hit in the kidney you know that you haven't just been hit cuz being hit anywhere in the body isn't great, but being hit specifically in the liver or the kidney really hurts. But the one that everyone overlooks is the solar plexus, which is the target for the right straight to the body and the jab to the body. And uh, Paul was doing a lot of that, and I thought it worked really well. And he was even doing the jab, the jab to the body backing up, which is a classic. Uh, well, Floyd Mayweather and Sugar Ray Robinson both did this, so you can be fairly sure it's a good strategy. But they used to to. Uh, lead their opponents around the ring by like backing up and dancing and um just you know well robinson was dancing more floyd was just pivoting off and and stalling for time but they would use the left straight sorry the left jab to the body really get in behind it like get down low shoulder is level with their solar plexus so the arms completely straight making the most out of your reach and they'd step in and drop down on it and it might as well have been like a barge pole, the way that dudes walked onto it and winded themselves. And it really calms people down. Well, not calms people down, but it settles them down. You know, if you've got someone really aggressive coming after you, the left, uh, sorry, the jab to the body is, is fantastic for that. And you saw Paul use that a lot too. The right straight to the body worked really well. He'd come up with the left hook afterwards. Did get caught with a good counter left hook by Woodley in the third round, I think it was. And that was you know, that when everyone went, oh, Woodley's got a left hook as well. Oh, very exciting. But that's the danger with the right straight to the body. You're you're dropping your right hand, especially if you don't level change all the way. If you lean forward with it a bit, which is what Paul was doing from time to time here. But the other thing about like the je- the right straight to the body and the jab to the body, uh, and, and he was throwing the one, two, both to the body, which is a really good idea because it's the Junior Dos Santos 101 sets the trap for the overhand. 
because as soon as you start level changing, they go, oh, body shot coming. And instead of throwing like a right straight to the head, which is, which can sometimes catch people out, you just wing that right hand over the top really wide. And he caught Woodley with an amazing one that made Woodley's legs go a little bit um, in, was that like the sixth or seventh? Uh, I mean, I don't remember the exact details of this fight because it was kind of just a, a blur, but um, there was a really good one and they showed it on the replay later. But yeah, it's, it's the... Um, it's a classic. Right straight to the body, right straight to the body. Duck down, right overhand. The blind right is what they used to call it with um, Rocky Marciano. Like you, you put your head down and you just throw your right hand over the top. But the other thing that I really liked about um, Jake Paul, which we talked about in the pre-fight, go back and check, but um, I, I said that he's very good at smothering people. So if he throws his right hand and he's worried about them coming back, because he's not great in combination. Like the, it's, it's very hard to throw good right hands and stay on position and that's what all the time working it in boxing does like guys it, it takes a lot to get to the level of the guys you see in professional boxing throwing combination punching and, and actually staying in range or moving with the opponent while he's also moving because they're not obliged to to exchange with you or stand there while you throw three or four fun punches um, that's the hard part throwing the punches and also being in range the entire time but landing the ones and twos is, is pretty simple you know that's just setups and um feints and, and draws and things. But because he's not great at the combination punching, what he'll do is he'll throw the overhand right or he'll throw the right straight to the body or whatever, and then he'll duck into a clinch or he'll just fall into the clinch and smother the opponent so they can't come back at him. Which many, many great fighters have done. The old punch and clutch. Um, Floyd Mayweather, obviously, did it hundreds of times against Ricky Hatton, but did it basically through his entire career. He would throw a big left hook or a big right straight and then clinch because he didn't want the opponent coming back at him. But you can also do it when the opponent throws, if you're worried about them following up. And when when Woodley landed like his two good punches in round four or whatever it was, um, Paul like just threw his arms over Woodley's back and Woodley, being in the practice of just taking underhooks, just took him and was like, oh shit, probably shouldn't have taken those. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, it was a decent enough fight. It was, um, you know, if you were an MMA fight, if you were an MMA fan cheering for Tyron Woodley, I imagine it was very disappointing. I, I think... What I said in the pre-fight was I was like, I don't know how much of a dead duck Woodley is here. You know, he's, it's not like Askren, where I felt very confident beforehand going like, I don't think Askren's going to do very well here. <laughs> he, he can't punch hard. There is no threat there, whereas, whereas Paul can actually crack a bit. Um, but with Woodley, there was the threat of the punching. But yeah, he's, he really does seem gone in the... What it, you know... <laughs> It's always a weird thing when people start talking about killer instinct and all that shit, but it does seem gone in Woodley. Um, after the fight, Tyron was incredibly t cringe. Like, he's going, uh, yeah, we're going to run it back. No one else can sell a pay-per-view like us two. And you're like, no, wasn't you, mate? <laughs> there's, there's a reason you took the fight uh, because of the money that Jake Paul's going to bring in. But Jake Paul, you know, obviously going to be cringe a lot of the time. I think he's a very interesting study as a character because I, I, you know, I've long believed that Logan Paul is an actual sociopath, but um, Jake Paul, you know, came up through. Well, people consider him like a Disney Channel kid, but he came up through Vine, and that was to do with being like linked with Logan Paul. But he's independently rich; he doesn't have to be doing this. And granted, he's making a lot of money through it, but I always think it's interesting when someone. Because it, a lot of top fighters will tell you that hunger is the very important thing. Um, you know, Mike Tyson, people like that, they'll say, like, my son can't fight because he doesn't have, like, he's not broke like I was. Like someone like um, Chris Eubank Jr., like, they, he's often hit with this criticism. Obviously a very talented fighter, but Chris Eubank Sr. was broke. Uh, don't be fooled by by the accent that people still don't know isn't his real voice. <laughs> like, you know... Uh, I mean, in the 90s, that was the thing. That was why people hated him. They were like, oh, he's putting on airs. Because he grew up in the roughest parts of basically every country he lived in. He lived in the slums of Kingston, Jamaica. He lived in uh, the slums of Brixton in London. Uh, he lived in the slums of the Bronx in New York back in like the uh, 70s. Um, so, yeah, he, he was not. He definitely wasn't like, yes, I'm Chris Eubank. You know, the, that voice wasn't his own. He put it on for the theatre of it and to make people hate him. But he was poor and hungry. And like that was the criticism of Chris Eubank Jr. He's not poor. His, his dad had money left over from being a world champion in a fixture of British boxing for years and years and years. 
and being a, a celebrity in part due to the hilarious accent and stuff and his mannerisms. Um, Mike Tyson said it about his son. He was like, he'll, he'll never be able to fight because he's not hungry. Uh, the old expression is like, oh, it's hard to get up for the morning runs when you're, when you're wearing silk pajamas or whatever it is. Um, but there are people who have come in to boxing and fighting and all sorts quite comfortable. Uh, like there's a, you know, BJ Penn is probably the most obvious one. One of the reasons that he was able to become so good so quickly was because his parents were already incredibly rich. So they sent him to Ralph Gracie's and just said, yeah, you can live in the dojo or whatever. <laughs> so he just, I mean, that's not to take away from the fact that he did the training every day, but he had the luxury of being able to do all that training every day without having to go and break his back in like a factory or something as well. But when BJ Penn was fighting and doing all those ridiculous fights at like welterweight, light heavyweight, uh, even heavyweight against um, Leoto Machida, he was doing that because he wanted to. And there's something to be said for that. You know, that's quite interesting about Jake Paul. He doesn't need to do this. He's got a net worth of like well over 20 million. He could put 2 million into, um, uh, you know, uh, an index fund and live a better life than you or I by just living off the um, interest. And there was an interesting story came up this week. We're going to segue into fighter pay, but there was an interesting story that he took less as of a cut of the pay-per-view um, in order to share it amongst fighters on the on the card with him. And if that's true, very cool. It, it's something that he does have the luxury of doing because he's like the name on that card. So he could have easily claimed like 50% of the revenue just for himself. But caveat that with, I'm always very cautious about stories like this. Like when Tyson Fury supposedly gave his entire purse from the Deontay Wilder fight to charity, for, you know, for mental health charities. And... I respect everything that, uh, that Tyson Fury is doing, talking about mental health and things like that. But there wasn't any, like, <laughs> no one ever proved that he did that. He just said he did it. <laughs> um, which, when I said it at the time, I felt really cynical saying it. But then Conor McGregor was like, I will donate $100,000 to Dustin Poirier's charity. And they never did. <laughs> um, but it is good that Jake Paul's bringing attention to uh, fighter pay in the UFC. And I'm just going to clear this up again because I've been going off on it on Twitter all week. But... If, like, we're talking about fighter pay and Jake Paul bringing attention to it, if your answer is, like, he doesn't care, he's just doing it for the clout or whatever, or just to create drama in the media, my answer is still, I don't give a shit. I, I don't care if he's sincere. Bringing attention on the fighter pay issue is the most important thing. Like, you get so used to the brain worms of being in, like, the culture war constantly that, like, you know, anyone I disagree with or don't like uh, has to be wrong. Practice living in England, where Tony Blair will occasionally come out and say the right thing. Not this time, not the most recent time where he's talking about, like, let's get back into Afghanistan or whatever. Um, but Tony Blair will occasionally come out and say something that, like, most people agree with. But you're just like, fuck off, Tony. No one wants to hear from you. And that prepares you for this quite well, I feel. But yes, Jake Paul, absolutely right about fighter pay. Is he sincere? Don't know. Don't care. Probably not. Still don't care. Are millions of people seeing this and just seeing the constant connection to the UFC and their shit fighter pay as he's fighting these washed old MMA fighters over and over again? Yes. Uh, and that's a bad look on the UFC, and I love it. Now, let's talk about the UFC, because you don't want to hear about fucking Tommy Fury or whoever else was on that card. Um, the UFC's card, uh, Edson Barbosa versus Giga Chikansi, I was very surprised by this one. Um, the main event that is because well, I, I did say in the week, like I'm coming around to the idea that like carefully seasoning fighters might be beneficial to the fighters themselves. Cause I really desperately don't want MMA to become the boxing prospect preparation route. One of the great joys of MMA is that you get the best fighting the best very early on. You know, think of that Conor McGregor, Max Holloway fight. Stuff like that, I mean, that's a very extreme example because of what they've both gone on to do. But stuff like that happens or did happen quite a lot in the UFC. That sort of stuff doesn't happen in boxing. Guys in like their ninth or tenth fight don't meet each other. One wins and then they both end up being like fighting for world titles later. It's, it's pretty fucking rare. But equally, there is something to be said for taking a step back in the level of competition. If you watch like Charles Oliveira, been mur like been in with murderers from the age of 20 has a very checkered record in the UFC, fights five or six guys who weren't that great in a row, builds up his confidence, knocks out or submits all of them, 
meets Kevin Lee, actual test, flies by it, meets Michael Chandler, has some trouble, but still smashes the best fighter. He's probably the best fighter he's ever beaten. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm comfortable saying that. Probably the best fighter he's ever beaten at the best point in his career and wins the UFC lightweight title. Uh, obviously, Habib had a build up against a lot of guys with no name and, and no record. Um, Marlon Vera had a good step back against some lower level competition, just fighting regularly and then jumped back into the sort of top 15, top 10. So I think there's something to be said for it because Giga Chikadze, his record read, well, while I was watching it happen and his record was like, it looked like someone was desperate to get him some high kick knockouts. You know, it was like Giga Chikadze famous for his kicks and then they couldn't get him to knock anyone out. So it was just like lining up these guys who he should beat and then he'd scrape a split decision over Brandon Davies or someone like that. Um, but he managed to finish his last two before this because it was some guy they brought in on short notice in his UFC debut and then Cub Swanson, who's very much on the way out now. And he got those two finishes and you're like, OK, well, but Edson Barboza has been fighting killers for the last five years. Everyone in the last five years that Edson Barboza has fought could beat everyone that um, Giga Chikadze had fought all together on the same night. Like, <laughs> like the guys that... Um, the guys that Barbosa was in with were just levels above Chikadze's level of competition. But does that wear on you? Has that affected Edson Barbosa? I thought this was a very interesting fight uh, tactically from Giga Chikadze because he comes from a team that knows Edson Barbosa can be run ragged by backing him up. And he went and stood on the fence. He did the Tyron Woodley. Um, it was very, very interesting. There was lots of cool stuff in this fight. Edson Barbosa had him on the fence and... Uh, Chikadze would try and kick off it. Firstly, I said, watch out, like, the Giga kick is just a left body kick. I've, I've heard people saying, like, it's a toe kick. It's a um, crescent kick. What are, like, it's just him throwing a left body kick, um, however he feels like throwing it at that time. And then he goes, that was the Giga kick. Everyone be careful. Uh, and someone pointed out to me, I think it was my, my man Chris on um, Twitter, pointed out that, like, if Crow Cop had called his kick the Crow Kick or some shit, some shit like that, we'd have all been like, that's pretty cringe, Crow Cop. I mean, you're a badass, but that's pretty cringe. Um, but what Chikadze does is he fights orthodox a lot and then he'll throw up like a step up left high kick. So something with not a lot of stank on it. And he'll step back into southpaw and draw you on to a hard body kick thrown with the left leg, which is now behind him. And he was trying to do that on Ned's and Bubbos are along the fence here. And I, we talked about this in the pre-fight on the boycast. I said... I would go for cross checks. I'd just pick your leg up, take it on your arms and your leg and, and really just belt and braces it because that's the thing that you've got to be worrying about the most. And to Edson's credit, he wasn't cross checking it, so he was doing it with his right leg. But he was really belt and braces um, taking that kick. Like he was making sure that it was on both forearms and his shin or knee, which can be really problematic because if you're a, a very powerful kicker and you're just kicking into people's checks, you know, you're going to hurt yourself more than them. And then we talked about like how Edson against Southpaws has been throwing, or certainly against Amakani since Amakani, has been throwing that shifting right straight where he throws the right straight and sort of like falls in behind it. And I said, that would be a nice weapon to use when Chikadze goes Southpaw. But I don't know if he'll land the... You know, the you, there's one thing you don't want to be doing against a guy who's looking for a left body kick or a left um, body strike of any kind is like lunging in behind your right hand. But he did it. He landed it a couple of times really nicely. Chikadze was doing very well, like he, he mainly straight hitting, but he was also doing quite well with a good uh, right hook off orthodox, sorry, off southpaw. Uh, so his lead hand hooking over Edson's lead hand. And it, he got Edson uh, quite concerned about stepping in very early. That was the, the thing that overwhelmingly stood out at me in this fight was that Edson was not stepping in as much as he should do. Like if you've got, because Edson should have been fighting the, the counter Edson Barbosa strategy. You know, if you've got a good kicker, um, you want to keep him on the back foot, you want to keep him against the cage, and you want to keep him overwhelmed. Because any time that you're fighting a good kicker, if you're standing in front of them at striking range and looking at them, you are giving them every chance to really fuck you up. <laughs> you know, you want them moving all the time, or just smashed against the fence, or being battered in close. Or you want to be out at such a space that like, if you take a little step back, they'll their kick will miss. Um, you know, standard dealing with the kicker is be too close or too far because kicking generally is uh you know it's it's an uh is about timing that getting on one leg if you're too crowded you can't do it comfortably if you're too far out you're just going to miss and give up your uh your stance your, your position 
And by standing on the fence, you can make people come to you that maybe shouldn't be as confident standing square in front of you like they're going to kickbox you. Um, but no, Edson looked very uh, skittish and ended up standing in kicking range, not doing things for an awful lot of the time in that fight. There was a really good one where, um, well, actually, Chikadze was doing really well throwing his legs and coming down with a punch afterwards or, or capitalizing with a punch afterwards, um, which is, uh, well, we were talking on the boy cast about uh, Andy Hook because it's 21 years since his passing. And I said that against um, Branko Sikadic, when Andy Hook had two professional fights as a kickboxer and Brando, uh, and Sikadic had just beaten uh, Ernesto Hoost uh, for the, and, and won the K1 Grand Prix. And Hug basically beat him by throwing the left kick and landing the left straight immediately afterwards over and over and over again. Because if you kick hard and it lands on someone's arm, they're not throwing out the punch immediately after with their arm. So it's pinned there for a little bit. You can pin people's arm with the kick while you come in with the punch afterwards. So Chikatsi did quite well doing that because Edson Barbosa was clearly very concerned about the kicks and then he came in with the punches afterwards instead and rattled Edson. Um... The one that he, I think the one that he caught him with right at the end that started like the beginning of the end rather um, was uh, an overhand to right knee, which is really interesting because that's something I've seen Benil Dariush do. And I think I picked up on it when he was doing it against Edson Barboza. You throw the wide overhand and then you bring the right knee straight up the middle uh, because the guy will raise his left forearm and elbow to deal with the overhand, to take the overhand. And you can just skewer his uh, his floating rib. Another great target on the body. But yeah, he really uh, upset Edson with that knee and then followed with punches quickly after and stumbled him. And then Edson got trapped along the fence. And it, it, was, a, it was a nice example of that Edson Barbosa weakness of being really bad at getting away from the fence, but only really used towards the end of the fight. Like uh, Chikadze already had him hurt. So rather than try and chase him around the fence the entire fight, he, he used it when he it most could benefit him. Another great example of that sort of like wave the big overhand and come up the center with your legs is uh, Jiri Prochatska. His favorite kick is he throws, like he waves his right hand like he's going to throw an overhand and he front kicks the guy in the body with his right leg. Does it every single time he fights, multiple times. But yes, very impressive performance from uh, Giga Chikadze against a very high level opponent. So what else was on this card? Um, you had the tough fights. So Brian Battle versus Gilbert Urbina. This is kind of weird because like I didn't watch the tough fights. Um, I, I think I said on the boycast, like I tried watching the Ultimate Fighter and then I was like, oh, fuck it, I'll just watch the fights. And then I was like, oh, fuck it, I'll just watch the fights of the people that I know are in the final. <laughs> and I still didn't get through them all. But um, Urbina wasn't actually supposed to be in the final. The guy who was supposed to be in the final had to pull out. So how bad is the Ultimate Fighter that you can't just delay it to the next card? Like It's not they were, like they were calling this the tough finale. It was Barboza versus Chikadze. UFC fight night, and then on the bottom of the poster, plus who will be the ultimate fighter. <laughs> so it's not like they're billing the whole card around this shit. They could have just waited a couple of weeks. But they got Gilbert Urbina, whose brother Hector Urbina is famous for getting knocked out by Vicente Luke very quickly. Um, and uh, yeah, Brian Battle survived early, did well. Um, you know, I'd seen, I'd watched Battle's fight on the um, ultimate fighter. And uh, yeah, front kicks, tall guy, does good stuff with that. But yeah, got taken down immediately and mounted. Knee to elbow and back to half and got the underhook and hit a stand up almost immediately. He was on point, but then Urbina had only trained for like seven days to get ready for this fight. So, um, yeah, kind of shit. And then Brian Battle just got on his back and choked him once he got tired. But the other one, the bantamweight final between uh, Ricky Tercius and Brady Heistand, or Heistand, Heistand, um, was really good. This deserved fight of the night and they didn't give it them. Um, apparently, uh, or, or they gave them like a shitty under the table bonus rather than the official 50,000 each. Um, Ricky Tercius is a lot of fun. Brian, Brian, uh, Brady, Brady Highstand came out trying to take him down. Tercius, this was a great night for Butterfly Guard. I mean, I think I say that every time now, but this was a great night for Butterfly Guard because Tercius was constantly getting back to Butterfly. Like even when Highstand passed him completely, got to side control, Tercius would uh, bridge, get his, get his knee and elbow together, put in the butterfly hook and, and start sweeping. And he managed to like, he used X guard twice in this fight to get a complete reversal. X guard is such a powerful position. It's very difficult to get to against very good fighters, obviously. But um, Tercius was able to do it several times in this fight. 
And he was always working from the bottom too. Like he was throwing up triangles. He was constantly hammer fisting back at um, at Heiston. He was using his knees to frame off him. Uh, he was hitting stand ups every time. And like it was like when Kelleher was doing it the other day. When you post on the guy with your arm, you open your legs, you get on your side, and you're on your hand, and then you just pick your leg up and, and try and stand up. And they they're left with like most of the time they end up chasing the single leg. And guys won't do it because they're like, oh, he'll just take me down with the single again. But people like Kelleher and Tercius are just like, fuck it, put him on the single. You know, I'd rather be defending the single than being on my back losing. So he was able to keep uh, keep getting back to the feet over and over again. Uh, his striking was a little bit. Mm, um, he he yeah he. I was looking at it going. He can't really like he doesn't get his hips and shoulders into his punches much. So he's trading punches and moving his head, but they're sort of disjointed. The, the kinetic chains or whatever are off. Um, but then he did land a good right hand and dropped high stand in the third round, I think it was. But he was stepping in on it. He was His weight was falling into it. It's interesting because he was booked to fight um, Yanez in FCC, uh, the fight before he went on to the Ultimate Fighter. Uh, Adrian Yanez, that is. And that would have been a very interesting fight because Adrian Yanez is a, a monster on the feet. And Tercius is game. And I like his head movement, but I don't think he has the, the pop to make people respect him. But yeah, really fun fight. If you're going to watch something from this card that you missed, that's the one to watch. So what else went on this card? Uh, Gerald Mearshat, <laughs> he uh, did the thing that he does where he gets beaten up, slowly advancing on the guy and tires him out. While hurting him with strikes that look like they're coming at half speed. Um, yeah, not much more to say about that. Just pretty cool that he did it again. Abdul Razak Al-Hassan versus Alessio de Chikoro. Someone said that this is now the, the horrible one-strike knockout KTFO'd, deaded lineage now, because it went from uh, Buckley's jumping back kick against that lad to De Chirico knocking him, I keep calling him De Chicoro, sorry, De Chirico knocking out Buckley with a one-shot head kick to <laughs> Razak El Hassan knocking out Chirico with a one-shot head kick. Um, truly incredible. But great. I mean, like, you know, we knew that Al Hassan was good at spazzing out in the first seconds of the fight, backed him onto the cage, sort of like fainted as if he was going to engage, and then jumped into a high kick. Can't complain. Can't complain. But if you want to hear me complain, let's talk about Sam Alvey versus uh, Wellington Thurman. Thurman, rather. Uh, this fight was absolutely hilarious. So Sam Alvey was on a streak of six fights un undefeated, which is to say that he... There was a draw in there, a split draw, and that saved him from being on a six-fight losing streak. But it was six fights since he last won. I think that was against the ghost of Rashad Evans. But Sam Alvey used to... He, had, he was on a good streak right at the start of his UFC career. He would stand on the fence, and as a southpaw, he would land a counter-right hook as the opponent stepped in, and dudes didn't really know what to do with it. And then very quickly, people learned not to do that. And so he was getting boxed up by people like the ghost of Little Nog. Jimmy Crute stopped him very quickly, you know. Um, and now he just sort of stands on the fence not doing enough. So Wellington Thurman took him down twice, I think, in like five attempts throughout the fight. But it was mainly like him entering clinches and threatening takedowns, landing some good strikes. Alvy landed some strikes. But Thurman was, he poked the eyes so much that um, the ref took a point in the third round. And then he did it again and the ref took a second point, which is very lucky because if you did it again and they'd already taken a point, they could have DQ'd you. But Sam Alvey had lost every round. So <laughs> it was 30-27 and Terman had two points taken away. So it worked out at 28-27. The, possibly the only 28-27 victory in UFC history. But Alvey was absolutely livid. He was running over and like, fuck all these judges. Um... And uh, yeah, but the, the hilarious thing is that Dana White afterwards was like, we're probably cutting Kevin Lee. And uh, no, Sam Alvey, he's important. It's important to have guys like him who bring it. And you mean like Sam Alvey doesn't bring it in like the sense that like he comes out and makes stuff happen and has interesting fights. Sam Alvey brings it in the sense that he will say yes to any fight and fight for very low amounts of money and is very publicly outspoken about being anti-unionization. Uh, if you ever want a good laugh, go read Sam Alvey's comments on unionization and firstly, how he doesn't understand the concept of it. But secondly, how he claims he's going to be the next Conor McGregor and he's worth more than all these other fighters or a lot of these other fighters. 
But he can fight at light heavyweight. So like if you know, so there's people like An- Anatolov and people like that who are just on like four fight losing streaks. Jan Valente, they still keep him around. Um, honestly, Sam Alvey could do with going to Bellator because no one is enjoying watching his fights. So what else happened? Dustin Jacoby versus Darren Stewart was interesting. I-, I joked about how Darren Stewart would find a way to fuck this up, and in fairness, he did. But I really liked what he was doing in the early going. He came out, Dustin Jacoby threw a step up left high kick and Stewart took it on the right forearm, scooped under with his left forearm. Perfect San Shao kick catch or, uh, I mean, or a Muay Thai kick, kick catch. That's how um, San Shao catches his kicks. But scoops underneath it, pulls it across the body, immediately goes in on a, a takedown and a back take attempt. Um, and Dustin Jacoby did a very good job of getting up. Both times that this happened, he was able to get a two on one, two hands gripping Stewart's wrist, pushing it away, working his way up to um, to his hand and then to his feet. And he was able to do that long enough that he was able to catch Stewart on the feet because Stewart is a little bit rough around the edges on the feet and Jacoby has some good kickboxing experience. Um, but ma- mainly what impressed me was Darren Stewart using the kicks to get takedowns and then Dustin Jacoby countering those takedowns. I thought those were both pretty impressive performances in those aspects. Daniel Rodriguez versus Kevin Lee. Um, this was, yeah, I mean, another turn in the Kevin Lee story uh, where I think we all, there's some people who think like he was always overrated, but I, I think most of us accept that he has like very real talent, but just isn't able to put it together. Uh, I'm questioning the choice to go to TriStar because TriStar is, I mean, I, I have enormous respect for Faraz Sahabi and that camp, but if there's one thing I've noticed from a couple of TriStar guys, uh, specifically Kevin Lee and Rory McDonald and, and GSP even actually, uh, it's that they don't have the ability to throw their right hand. They get so co- um, confident behind the jab that they then, when they do throw their right hand, it looks really uncomfortable and they can't follow up on it. You know, we were talking earlier about Jake Paul and like how hard it is to get good at throwing the right hand and then building combinations off it. And it, that's what really good boxers are able to do. But um, if you watch, I think it was George St. Pierre versus Jake Shields where George St. Pierre just looks like he's never thrown a right hand in his life. It's, it's truly bizarre. He's trying to like step in and hit with power with his right hand, and he's just looping these arm punches that don't have any hit behind him. And it, it was the same watching Kevin Lee do this, and Rory McDonald's always had a problem with it. But um, yeah, Kevin Lee's right hand is just sort of like a very long reach, um, whereas his jab's quite nice. You get the sense watching um, St. Pierre in that Shields fight, but Rory McDonald and um, Kevin Lee, like... They know that they've got a good jab and they want to fight clinically behind that jab and they lose that sort of, they lose the roughness because of it. You know, you should be pushing your advantages. You should be landing the right hand whenever you can. Um, and certainly I'd love to see Kevin Lee kick more because a lot of his best work in, in this fight and in the Trinaldo fight and in a couple of others, he's thrown up a good high kick and either caught the guy by surprise or then landed a good punch after it. Um, and I think he could he could be really just abusing the low kick and the body kick, because he's a very, very strong wrestler. And, uh, you know, it, it's such a, a huge advantage. And he's basically cut himself down to one weapon, which is the jab. Even when he switches his stances, he does it just jabs off both sides. He did eventually switch to a southpaw with Rodriguez and land a really good calf kick that like, took Rodri- Rodriguez off his feet. But I would love to see him, because, like, he's comfortable switching stances. So I'd love to see him just matching stances with Rodriguez and going for the calf kick whenever he could. But yes, I think like training at TriStar where they love, where they worship the jab <laughs> and uh, the training at uh, Mayweather Boxing Gym probably give him a bit too much confidence in being like a clean technical boxer. It's kind of like, you know, Andre Olovsky was another guy who sort of suffered from focusing on his boxing. Um, and then once he went back to Jackson Wink the first time returning there, uh, he just started opening up with his right hand and, and had much more success as a result even though he'd been working with Freddie Roach and Freddie Roach loved him and said how great his boxing was coming along. But Daniel Rodriguez impressed me. I thought he looked really good. Uh, it, actually, there was one part of this fight that I really... Well, Rodriguez looked decent on the ground, but Kevin Lee, his finishing bad takedown attempts, because he'll do... He'll, he'd attempt to take down and Rodriguez would have his number. He'd go like, oh, no, I want it. Sprawl. And Kevin Lee would keep the single and he'd do what's called um, a cutback, which is where you, uh, you basically get your head across the opponent's other hip and you pull your, your knees up underneath you and you turn the corner like you would on a double leg, but with the single leg and you put them flat on their back. And he did that, I think, twice or three times in this fight. It, it was gorgeous. Like Kevin Lee can finish a takedown in dire circumstances really well. 
and it, it played out actually quite similar to the Ally Quinta fight in the in the early going because Kevin Lee took him down, got on his back, and sort of lost it. And you know, you've seen him on Kiesa's back, and he finished him. But like, he's very good at taking people down, smothering them, passing, getting to their back, to just like the flow chart to an awesome easy finish. And then if he loses it at any point, it starts going downhill. But yeah, don't want to take away anything from Rodriguez because the focus tends to end up on Kevin Lee because we all know he is a super talent and it's just not coming together. Um, but Daniel Rodriguez looked really good. I didn't remember him when I was looking down this card originally, but then I remembered that I had seen him because like, well, firstly, you know, I'm always complaining about how awful everyone's tattoos are. But I looked at his tattoos and I was like, oh, I know this guy. He's great <laughs> before the fight started. Um, and yeah, he, he is good fun. I'm a really big fan of him. But yes, if the UFC cut Kevin Lee, that would be a really strange decision because, you know, he's he is stumbling at the moment, but he could go and mop up in Bellator. And he's at the stage in his career where people would go, yeah, he was, you know, now he's got it together. I could see him beating the top lightweights in the UFC. He's, you know, you want to, if you're getting rid of people to Bellator, you want to make sure that they've either like run their course athletically or they're on so many loss or they're on a streak of so many losses. If they start losing, if if they start winning in Bellator, it looks really bad for Bellator, like Sam Cecilia. Anyway, other good stuff. Um, Pat Sabatini versus Jamal Emmers was interesting. Emmers, we were talking about reaching with the right hand, but I've never seen anyone do it quite like he does. Like, he reaches out like he's trying to get something down from inside a vending machine. It's just like full shoulder in behind him. Um, but yeah, he stunned Sabatini and Sabatini was on his back. Sabatini used the butterfly guard really nicely. Got in underneath him for a... Looked like he was trying to get under like an X guard. Um, and he switched it over, got the 50-50 position. 50-50... Um, shout outs to T.P. Grant, um, uh, Bloody Elbow writer uh, and, uh, yeah, former colleague of mine. But he put up the clips of this fight and I was watching it going, oh, yeah. Um, but he was talking about the 80-20, which is something that, oh, fuck, what was his name? Josh Hadley, Hayden, something or other like that. But uh, he was he was putting out a DVD on it way back in the day. And apparently, like, they, him and his brother went against the Dan Danaher death squad before they were really famous and used to give him trouble with this. But the 80-20 is something you'll see, like... Um, Lachlan Giles talk about now, but it's when in your if you're in the 50-50, you turn in towards the leg that's trapped, and you slip your knee below the line of their uh, below below the line of their knees, but you keep your your control on their leg. So once your knee goes down and it hits the mat, uh, your foot is no longer in their hip pocket, ready to be heel hooked, and they don't really have the this. It's not 50-50 anymore. It looks like 50-50, but it's not a 50-50 uh, proposition. So he had. Uh, Emma's like trying to toe hold his free leg while he was sitting there methodically going, get rid of that top leg, get on the heel hook. Oh, his top leg's back in. I'll just get rid of that again, get on the heel hook. And he was just putting together the finish methodically, while, you know, while recovering from being rocked with punches earlier, while um, Emma's was spazzing out trying to toe hold him like it was Pancrase. So it was a really nice finish. Go watch that one again. And I think that's pretty much everything good from that card. Let's do a question before we get ahead for this week, and I've picked a, a pretty inside baseball one. Hi, Jack. Love your podcast, even though my girlfriend loathes the introduction of Oi Oi, It's Your Boy into my vocabulary during this lockdown. Uh, I've got a question building off one you answered at the end of the Ige vs. Jung post-fight podcast. I was really happy to hear you mentioning the lead leg sidekick as a secondary kick to a missed round kick, where you end up in open stance. I believe the lead leg side kick is most effective in an open stance matchup when you have inside foot position. This effectively squares your opponent's torso, presenting a larger target for you to attack with your heel while putting your hips in a good position to generate power for the kick, kicking side glute and shoulder facing the opponent. My question is, what do you think are the benefits of inside foot position for an open stance matchup in MMA? Commentators tend to talk at length about the benefits of outside foot position for landing power shots from the rear side. However, I rarely hear anyone discuss the different weapons available from inside foot position. Keep up the good work, mate. Scott. Um, yes. Okay, right. Quick quick recap for any of the newbies in because it's a Jake Paul podcast. But uh, open stance is Southpaw versus Orthodox or Orthodox versus Southpaw. I mean, it's the same either way. But your stances don't match. Closed stance is when you're both left footed or you're both right footed. Simple enough. Uh, the missed round kick, uh, I wasn't talking about getting into an open stance, I don't think. I mean, you could if you throw your, like, your right round kick and then you end up with your other side foot forward. I was specifically talking about uh, using the, the side kick as a secondary kick 
if you miss like a step up inside low kick. So if you watch uh, Zhang Weili or Weili Zhang, whichever one's the correct one, um, in her fights that weren't the surprising knockout against uh, Jessica Andrade, she throws the inside low kick a ton, misses it a ton, but when the opponent tries to come back in on her after she's missed it, she steps up into the side kick. Because the, the missing of the round kick blades your body into a side-on stance. However, I will say, like, now talking about like an open stance situation, so when you're southpaw versus orthodox or orthodox versus southpaw, when the opponent's trying to circle round to outside foot position around your lead leg, stepping outside your lead leg and circling that way, that is a great time to throw the step up in, uh, to, to throw the step up side kick. Michael Chandler did it to Eddie Alvarez, I think, once. And um, Holly Holm used to do this a lot, actually, because a lot of the people she fought, they like they had been told, circle to the outside of the lead leg, just keep doing it. And it's a great one for that. Um, and obviously, like everyone knows, when you're a southpaw versus orthodox, the lead leg side kick to the opponent's lead leg, stamping on their knee or shin, is is there like the whole time. But other techniques with inside foot position. So that's when southpaw versus orthodox. Um, let's say I'm the orthodox fighter. My left foot, instead of going outside of their lead foot, so I can throw my right hand down the down a shorter line, so that I can put their center line on my shoulder line, uh, I put my left foot inside their foot. Now this is interesting because we were talking about Manny Pacquiao's retirement on the boycast. Uh, was that last week or the week before? But um, must have been last week. We were talking about his retirement and how often he used the inside foot position. He would step to the inside of his opponent's lead foot as the southpaw with a jab and then a left straight and then a right sort of up jab afterwards. And he, that three punch combination would then lead into like five or seven punch combinations. Uh, and he did great work with it. And it still surprises people like Keith Thurmond, like Thurmond, he um, knocked him down with it. But that's from stepping to the inside angle. The lead hook is something that's really benefited by stepping to the inside angle. Um, if you watch Miguel Cotto versus um, the great, great Argentinian Sergio Martinez. Um, Martinez is the southpaw. Miguel Cotto keeps stepping to the inside of his lead foot and loading up the left hook behind him. And he can swing it over because his his lead shoulder ends up inside of uh, Martinez's lead shoulder and it makes the angle, shortens up the punch. Another example would be... Um, Andre Ward versus Chad Dawson did the same thing over and over again. It, it makes it harder to follow up if you really step deep and you throw the, the lead hook, but it means you can get like almost chest to chest with them and hit them from the outside. Inside foot position also good for spinning techniques. So if you uh, if the opponent steps outside your lead foot and steps in with like a, a rear straight classic southpaw 101 or, or versus southpaw 101, you can spin into the back elbow really well. Um, you can step down the inside of theirs with a jab and jump into a, a, a turning back kick, Raymond Daniels style, but not to the groin. Actually, you know, if you do it South Pole versus Orthodox, your chances of hitting the groin are almost zero because the opponent's lead leg's going to be in the way. And of course the hug tornado, but I mean, that's from a bit further out. But um, Nikki Holskin used to do a kick that was really quite interesting. Uh, was it Holskin or was it someone else? Might have been Kyria. Uh, but he used to do a kick that was like a, he'd turn for a back kick and instead deliver like a wheel kick to the body. So turn and then straighten the leg and hit, kick with the heel coming in from the side rather than pushing out straight. That's something you could do. You could spin into a no soto gari. I, I've seen people do that before. You spin and then you end up like thigh to thigh or, or hamstring to hamstring and you try and bundle them over backwards. Or there's a beat throw if you, uh, if you know it as that. But yeah, there's, there's options. Um, a lot of them come off like jabbing to the inside foot position because if you jab to inside foot position, you can then step out to your right and come back with the right hand. Is my dy dynamic mic making me sound quiet? Yeah, quieter going off to the right. But if you jab in and put your foot inside the opponents and then you step off to the side, that you can take that little angle, or quite a big angle actually, if you if you pull it off. And if you're getting really, really extreme with your examples, uh, stepping to inside foot position would enable you to do an ashy slide on the rear leg. <laughs> so like Sakuraba used to do sweep singles on the rear leg. So if you watch him versus uh, Igor Vovchanchin, he lets Vovchanchin come in on him, ducks in and slides on his knees around to Vovchanchin's back leg and takes him down. Absolutely gorgeous. But you could attempt to slide in with like a high crotch grip. And because your feet are now inside the opponents, you could slide through on a, on a leg entry if you're absolutely mental and much better at fighting than me. But uh, I, it's a possibility. And of course, the um, Iminari roll is another one where if you step to the inside, it's a lot easier or at least changes your, um, the, your mechanics slightly. 
But yes, uh, it's something that people should play with. Uh, the other one would be like the the uh, crescent kick. If you step in uh, inside the opponent's lead leg with your lead leg, throwing a jab, and then you pull back and throw the kick from inside their leg, you throw up the Cyril Garn inside-out kick to their head. That would be dope. Anyway, that's enough um, examples of uh, bollocks you could try. Go and try some bollocks. Right, I've been talking bollocks for over an hour. It'll, it'll be less than that when I edit it, but uh, yeah, that's, that's quite good for today. I am going to be back on either Wednesday or Thursday for the boycast. It, I'm trying to go longer on these ones too, but we I mean, we went like an hour and a half on the boycast on Thursday. Yeah, get some really good bants in, and um, yeah, it's just good fun. So if you want to sign up for the Patreon, become a boy, and get extra pod each week, uh, do that. If you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. And remember, if you're a Patreon boy, put Patreon boy in it so that I answer the question on the Patreon podcast rather than the normal podcast. Don't want anyone missing out on stuff that they can't hear. Um, and if you want to see what I'm writing anytime, fireprimer.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack, simping for Dana White and opposing better fighter pay because I don't like Jake Paul. Bless. <laughs>